Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have an incredibly educational program for you this evening, and I am thrilled to have Mike Bush, CEO of Savvy Aviation, with us to talk about surviving the mechanic shortage and uh, all the different ways to get through some very, very challenging times right now. Uh, first of all, before we get started, I'd just like to recommend that everyone get out there. We are here to support flying and aviation and get everyone going. And socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps have tens of thousands of aviation events there. I just checked out the map. It is packed with things happening. And the best part is so many of them are in-person events where you can fly to them and get have pancake breakfast, educational seminars, things like that. There's just so much going on. So we want everybody to get out there and fly. And you do that by checking out Social flight. In addition, our Fly to Win Challenge has prizes. We're giving away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 on June 1st. So all you have to do is get the mobile app, check in at your local airport or a different airport. Just keep using that and uh, you'll have an opportunity to win that Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. Tonight's program is brought to us by Continental Aerospace Technologies. They are strong supporters of social flight. I'm grateful for that. They make all of this possible. And I fly, of course, behind a Continental engine, Continental cylinders, and it's just been, been really great. Now to tonight's guest. Mike Bush is arguably the best known airframe and power plant mechanic in general aviation. He founded Savvy Aviation in 2008 to provide aircraft owners, including uh, with support, consulting services, and management. That includes pre-buy management, innovative engine monitor analysis, 24-7 breakdown assistance. That's basically AAA for GA. There's just so many great things that uh, happen through both what Mike has done in all of his writing as well as through Savvy Aviation. Mike has authored hundreds of articles and four books on aircraft ownership and maintenance. And tonight, I'm going to talk with Mike about the mechanic shortage, how we got here, and how can you can ensure that your aircraft remains airworthy in a world where finding an available mechanic is becoming more and more of a challenge. I'm going to bring Mike on the line now. Please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Mike Bush. How are you doing, Mike? There I am. There you are. Hey. <laughs> Uh, welcome and evening, thank you yeah. so much for joining us you know um to 600 of our best friends <laughs> yes <laughs> um you, you know uh you wrote an article recently in aopa magazine about the mechanic shortage and i think this is something so many people are experiencing that we really need to understand let's start with the let's start with how we got here how did we get to a point well I, I, so actually, I actually here? wrote an article for aopa pilot about two years ago called the looming mechanic shortage. The, the, the article I wrote in the most recent issue of AOPA pilot was called mechanic crisis. It ain't looming anymore. <laughs> um, it is it's, hard it's upon problem. us. So uh, what made that, like you, you've obviously forecast this two years ago, as you mentioned, how did we wind up in the situation as bad as it is today first? Well, <clears throat> I mean, the, the short answer is that um, that shops have been losing staff uh, on a secular, you know, a, 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 on an ongoing basis, and they're not able to hire new mechanics. It's extreme. Every shop I I I talk to is short staffed and is doing everything it can to find new mechanics. Um, and with, without very much success. And, and, and it's a complicated issue. I, I think it's been a long time coming because the, the, the being a general aviation A and P is simply um, not a great uh, career path right now. They're, they're 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 you know not very well paid, and there's there's lots of issues there. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people who are working on GA airplanes are doing it because they love the airplanes, not because it, it it's a good way to 
to pay the rent or put food on the table. Do and you, and, you I, think, think and I think and I think it's like like did we have a generation essentially starting to retire and having to replace them of of mechanics? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There's there there's been a, you know a lot of attrition in 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 that area, but I think it's also been aggravated and accelerated by this strange um, post-COVID phenomenon where COVID kind of forced people either not to work or to work from home. And a lot of them basically decided they didn't want to go back to the office. Um, but you know the 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 number of new mechanics entering the field is way lower than it needs to be. The the um, AMT schools uh, graduation rate has been going down um, every year, and when an AMT graduates from school. Um, and, and he looks at his opportunities, he's much more likely uh, to, to go to work for the airlines or a corporate flight department than he is um, to go to work at a shop that, that, that works on owner flow and general aviation. Hmm. Um, you know, it used to be most of the, for most of my five decades in aviation, it used to be that the the limiting factor for throughput for maintenance shops was how many square feet of hangar space they had and how many airplanes they could get in. That's not true anymore. Not now, now it's how many mechanics they have. And if you look at any shop nowadays, a lot of their their, their hangar space is, is 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 full of of airplanes that are stuck, where, mm. where they're they're in pieces and not and no work's going on because either there's not enough staff to work on them or they can't get the parts that they need to work on them. Um, so a, a lot of the square footage that used to be live is now dead. Right. Uh, but it's it's just it's a really serious situation, and and I, I don't think there's any question that it's going to get worse before it gets better. I think the I think everybody in the industry has to somehow unite behind a program to to make it get better and to turn the corner. But uh, but it things are definitely in a downtrend. We seem to have a perfect storm right now of fewer mechanics due to retirement and attrition and not fast mechanics as you mentioned not a lot of mechanics entering the force um uh, a huge bump in general aviation and and the number of aircraft that are looking to stay airworthy and and things like that being and flow flight hours and 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 i think from and you mentioned this uh, in the hangar we're also seeing that the concept of the aging aircraft and how neglected some of these aircraft have been is are, that's weighing on the shops as well I mean, we're hearing a lot about aircraft that e become long-term projects whether the owner wants them to or not or whether it's something that the owner just bought well that's true but I, i'm not sure that that um that has i'm not sure that situation has changed a whole lot in the mm. last five years or so what what's changed is is the two things staffing and and uh, supply chain hmm so um, you so you don't think a lot of it is kind of the gold rush going on in general aviation where people are just buying planes and not necessarily realizing that they're not getting a quality aircraft <laughs> or something like that it, most of it's just the availability of parts and availability of the techs. Yeah, I mean, I, m most of the the good shops that that we work with um, have schedules that are booked out for a year. 
Wow. And they, they, they tell their clients, you know, when, when they're wrapping up their annual that, that they better, they better get on a schedule for a year from now or the, or, or they won't get in. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, you know, had a, 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 a new uh, client with a Cessna Corvallis, which is a, a, a pretty sophisticated and specialized airplane um, in New Orleans, which is essentially a maintenance black hole. There's, there's, there's hardly, it's really hard to find maintenance near, near New Orleans. So you have an airplane like a Corvallis, you know, you, you, you probably going to be able to do your oil changes locally, but you're probably have to take it somewhere for the annuals. If you want to get a shop that, that, that knows the airplane and its, and, and its systems and so on. And cause there aren't a lot that know how to work on that airplane. So I had him call the Tennessee aircraft services, Paul new shop. And he, he, his next, his annuals is due in February of 24. Um, they put them on a waiting list. They said, you know, we, 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 we can't squeeze you and we'll put you on a waiting list in case there's a cancellation. Wow. Um, he's probably gonna have to take his airplane to Texas or something for the annual. Cause he did, there, there just aren't a lot of, of choices for an airplane like that. Right. If you, if you want to get the work done right. And, you know, I had a long talk with him about the, the maintenance he's been getting locally and, and it's, it's a disaster. The guys have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and and that's kind of been my experience in the New Orleans area. It's really hard to find really good. There, there, are, there are a bunch of places in the country that are just, I consider kind of like maintenance black holes where it's very, very difficult to, 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 to find, you know, competent maintenance, especially for a sophisticated airplane. What do you think the reason is that the opportunity out there isn't being kind of filled faster. So for instance, if a shop could raise their rates and have availability and then fill it because the demand is in the market or show up in a location that's a black hole for maintenance and charge whatever they want to charge and be a gold-plated shop that we all dread. But why do you think that these these opportunities aren't being exploited? Well, I mean, I've, I've been saying for years that 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 the shop rates are way too low and um and mechanic pay a and p pay is is simply not competitive um a um, guy a guy likes to work on on stuff is can make a lot more money working on automobiles than he can on airplanes and he could certainly make a lot more money working in the airlines than he can working in the ga shop and and if we're going to have enough maintenance infrastructure to to be able to maintain our airplanes we're going to have to do something about that and um, um, a lot of the shop owners that i that i talked to they, they 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 fully understand the problem but they're scared to raise their rates because they don't want to alienate their customers and want to send them off to the competition although I don't think that's really a problem because the competition is booked out a year in advance. Um, shops are, are are now triaging their schedule. That were you know that there there have been more and more cases where an owner is is on a shop schedule for for an annual inspection. He's he, he's scheduled it six months out, and as the the date approaches, the the shop calls him and says, "I'm I'm sorry." we're not going to be able to do your annual this year. We're too far behind. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we made our shop schedule on the, uh, on the basis that we, we had five A and P's on the floor working, but right now we only have three and we just, we just can't do it. And so we're going to have to, we just have to turn some of our customers away. Mm -hmm. And various shops, you know, have various algorithms for that. I mean, one of the shops that I've, I've talked to in New Jersey, he says, you know, I give top priority to the local flight school. And then 
whatever capacity is left, I give the next priority to owner flown airplanes that, that are flying over 100 hours a year. And, you know, the weekend flyers are, are at the bottom of my priority list. I'm very unlikely to be able to accommodate any of them. And that's just, you know, that's just, but this, this issue of not being able to even keep up with the, with the schedule that, that the shop's already committed is, is going to increase. Yeah. And then when something unexpected happens, like, you know, like this, this continental uh, counterweight AD, that all of a sudden there's, you know, hundreds of airplanes that unexpectedly are going to have to have a couple of cylinders removed, you know, to comply with an AD before further flight, they're grounded. There's no capacity in the system to deal with something like that or the superior, you know, valve AD that just came up recently. Um, th th I mean, this is, this is a terrible situation. So, you know, one, one of the essential elements I, I think is, is got to be that this has to become a more attractive career path for people and they have to be paid a decent amount of money. I mean, it's crazy that somebody who works on airplanes should, should be making less money than they would make working on, you know, at the, at the GM dealer across the street. Right. That's got to change. Um, and we need to start figuring out how to get more people uh, graduating from uh, from from AMT schools, um, and I think one of the answers to that is to have programs to get them started on that path while they're in high school. Um, I I had a extended conversation recently with uh, with a. a with a nonprofit startup called Legacy Aviation Training Center up in Traverse City, Michigan, um, that that is um, there. It sounded to me like an absolute model of the kind of thing we we need to promote all over the country. Um, they are partnering with high schools in the area to start getting people on a track to become aircraft mechanics while they're juniors in high school. And by the time they graduate high school, they, uh, they'll have completed all the work for the mechanic general exam. And then after high school, they'll be able to go into a 12 month program to complete the, the airframe and power plant stuff. And, uh, and, and graduate one year after high school graduation with with, a, with an A&P certificate. Hmm. And then we have to figure out a way to, to, to get more of them to opt into general aviation maintenance as opposed to airlines and other stuff. Yeah, we had a, a, a few people have chimed in uh, uh, who are currently uh, either in or coming out of uh, part 147 schools. And what's interesting is there's a lot of commonality where they're saying that surprisingly that a lot of uh, GA facilities aren't really that interested in them because they're so busy. They don't want to train anybody. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a kind of a chicken and egg problem, but, <laughs> but that, I mean, that's certainly not what I'm hearing from, from the shop owners that I talk to. They, they, are all desperate to hire qualified mechanics and yeah. they're, they're, you know, they're willing and look, you know, it's just getting an A&P is just like getting a pilot's license to license to learn. You know, you, you don't come out of A&P school, you know, fully, uh, full performance level, if you will. Uh, you, you, you you have to, spend some time in the trenches and, and, and get coached and stuff like that. So there is a certain amount of training that's, that, that's required, but 
you know, I'm, I'm fearful that if we don't turn this around pretty quickly, not only are aircraft owners going to be in a big pickle, but I'm really concerned that, that, that a lot of shops are going to start to go out of business. Um, I, I sort of developed a, a, a theory that in most airport settings, a, a GA shop has to have five mechanics working in order to be a viable business, in order to be able to amortize all the fixed costs of, you know, of, of, of renting their hangar space and paying for their insurance. And um, there's a lot of fixed costs involved in, in, in running a shop. And, and you have to have a certain amount of throughput in order to be able to, to, to be viable. And um, my, you know, my general visceral sense, this isn't an absolute rule, sort of my kind of rule of thumb that, if a shop drops below that level of having five uh, uh, mechanics on the floor, they're they're going to wind up in a in a downward tailspin and eventually you know, got to go out of business. And and uh, and you know another another problem that aggravates this is that most maintenance shops, um, not all, but most maintenance shops are are run by people who are technically qualified in the maintenance area, but not very good businessmen. And it's not, e it's, it's not easy to, to, to run a profitable maintenance shop. Yeah. Um, you know, juggling the schedule and, and, and getting the mechanics to, you know, to, to be able to make 80% of their time billable and stuff. That, that's, that's hard. It's really right. hard. Um, and, and being able to deal with, you know, unplanned eventualities like, you know, the continental IT and stuff. Um, th there aren't a lot of directors of maintenance that are really capable of doing that. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough, tough way to make a living. So let's talk about some of the tips and, and kind of ideas what people can actually do in this environment to to help themselves. And I know, certainly I mean, there's, there's 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 a couple of different levels of things. I mean, first first of all, we one thing we're talking about is we we need, we need to we we need to make these maintenance shops more successful by raising their rates and and and. Right, but we don't raise the rates for them as customers, right? So no, 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 exactly. But in the meantime, as an aircraft owner facing this horrible situation, what, what, you know, what can the aircraft owner do to, to weather the storm? I mean, there's really two issues. One is to, uh, how you how you stop the storm, and the other is what do you do while the storm's going on? And whether it seems to me there's a bunch of things that 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 we have to do to weather the storm. Um, one is that we need to, the owners need to adopt the, the sort of minimalist maintenance philosophy that I've been preaching for, for years and years. And the subject of my first book, Manifesto, most TA airplanes are grossly over-maintained. And I mean that's fine if the owner has lots of money and the shop has lots of resources, but but right now the if 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 we over maintain the airplanes, then fewer of them are going to be able to, to to get through the shop in a year. So we we just have to start doing less maintenance on these airplanes, and and we can. Like I said, most most airplanes are are over maintained by a very large factor and and we need to start you know stop doing things by by chapter five in the book where you know 
props are overhauled every six years and you know all of this stuff that comes due batteries have to be changed every two years and all that. that's all nonsense you know we should be doing all of this stuff on condition and and doing a whole lot less of it and so um, so it seems like an example of how to because because the logical question for that or, or after that is how does an owner who's not the maintainer directly not the shop that they deal with control that and i know we've seen one example i'm not trying to make a sell for savvy but the reality is when you guys help manage an aircraft you're able to push back on the shop and say no 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 to these different exactly. items exactly we need, exactly. we need to teach people how to do that for themselves also yeah and, it, and it's it's hard for owners to say no to their mechanics it shouldn't be but it is and, and you know i started savvy 15 years ago but the 10 years prior to that I, I was going around the country giving seminars for aircraft owners to try to teach them how to manage their maintenance. And and what I discovered in 10 years of doing that is very few owners, even if they know exactly what they should do, um, have the courage to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, that was sort of, that, that's when I decided to start Savvy Aviation and say, okay, if, if owners can't do it, maybe they can hire us and because we'll, we'll be very good at saying no to the shops. <laughs> Plus, if, if the no comes from a fellow IA instead of from an aircraft owner, the shop is more likely to accept the no, you know. <laughs> it's just, right. um, but, but we have to start doing less maintenance on these airplanes. We have to be maintaining them on condition and we have to get out of our heads this notion that more maintenance is better because it's you know it's demonstrably provable that more maintenance is worse mm -hmm. um, it, you know the, the they, they they found this out in in world war ii the airlines found this out in the 60s when they came up with reliability centered maintenance um and and most aviation does things in a much leaner way, maintenance-wise, except for owner-flown GA, which, to to a large extent, still does maintenance the way it was done in the 1950s. Yeah. Um, but we, we have to change that now because we don't we we just don't have the luxury of over over maintaining airplanes anymore because there aren't enough mechanics to do it. Yeah. The second thing is owners are going to have to do more of their own maintenance. Um, and, yeah, you know, because, you know, maybe we only have to do one annual a year, but we, we probably have to do, you know, four well changes a year. Yeah. We have to stop and, having and, shops. And, 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 if, and if, and if we have, you know, if, if, if we have to wait three months to get in for an oil change, the, our appliance aren't going to be able to fly. Yeah. So owners are going to have to do more maintenance of more preventive maintenance. I think we we need to make use of the Khalil decision <laughs> that that expands the scope of what owners are allowed to do. That that there was a legal decision in, in what was it 2009, I think, from the Office of General Counsel that basically said, despite what the regulations say, those 41 items that are listed in Part 43, Appendix A, sub C, that, that are, are preventive maintenance items. Those aren't the only preventive maintenance items. There are lots of other things mm -hmm. that the FA would consider to be preventive maintenance that, that, that a pilot rated owner is allowed to do on his own recognizance without getting an A&P involved. Yep. So we, we just, owners need, are going to need to do more of their own maintenance in order to be able to keep flying. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're and they're going to have to work with their shops to to perform the, the maintenance in a in a more economical and efficient fashion. We, we don't have the luxury of over maintaining our airplanes anymore. Well, it seems like another aspect of that is that if the owners do take advantage of doing as much as they possibly can with, uh, you know, uh, uh, tires, wheels, brakes, bearings, um, uh, oil changes, things like that, that leads directly into the idea of trying to get shops focused more and more on the inspection aspect of an annual inspection. 
versus the corresponding they call it inspection but there's you know routine maintenance that's part of it takes up so much time. right the the the, the, the um, I mean that's that's obviously is, is been one of savvy's hot buttons from from the beginning of time and 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 it was something that i preached vociferously for prior to when we started savvy and that is we we have to impose discipline on the shops that do our annual inspections to complete the inspection first before they start fixing anything and before they start ordering parts we need to get a a comprehensive discrepancy list from the shop with um, recommendations for remedying various discrepancies and cost estimates for doing that and then we have have to we the the aircraft owners have to go over that discrepancy list with a very sharp pencil and say yes you can do I'd like you to do items, you know, two, three, four, seven, and twelve, but I don't want you to do the other ones. Mm -hmm. I, um, but if the shop doesn't s segregate the annual, the the inspection part from the from the repair part, then the owner never gets an opportunity to 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 get into the decision loop in that way and make a decision as to what work he wants done and what work he doesn't want done and what work he wants a second opinion on. And and, um, and, and that's how they get stuck in shops. Yeah, and, and um, um, you know, th th this is a discipline that if you take your car in for repair, it's a discipline that, that that the state imposes that they have rules that automotive maintenance shops have to work on. and one of those rules is they can't turn a wrench on your car or a screwdriver unless they give you a written work order with a, with with a, a, a detailed accounting of what work they're going to do and then um and what it's going to cost and you have to put your signature on it approving it and then they can't exceed the estimate that they've given you by a significant amount, you know, more than like 10%, without stopping work and going back to you and saying, you know, while we while we had this thing apart, we found something we didn't expect, and we we really need to do something else that we hadn't planned on, and it's going to cost so much, and get your get your approval on that. Yeah. Um, but. And and that's regulated by 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 every state has a some kind of a bureau of automotive repair that has oversight on the on, on automotive shops and Im imposes those that that discipline on the shops, but that's not true in aviation. There's right. there's no state that has a bureau of aviation <laughs> repair, or aircraft repair. The it, it's the wild west, you know, and yeah. and owners. Are, have to impose that discipline on the shop. They have to say no. You can't inspect a little, fix a little, inspect a little, fix a little, because then I don't have control over stuff. And right. I've basically given you a, you know, car blanche, and 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 then when the invoice comes, it's going to be a complete shock. Uh, I I need you to inspect things until the inspection is done. Give me a comprehensive list of what you found, and then we sit down and negotiate. You know what what repairs we're going to do yep um, the uh the other thing that uh i know i've been telling folks that i i advise you, you know it used to be that at, in in the older days when things were a little easier that you always wanted to stretch your annual to 13 months and signing it off and get a free month and all these things i've been advising people based on how many cancellations have been happening how many problems have been happening that you've actually got to book your annual before it to do 11 months instead of 13. Yes, huh? <laughs> yeah, do 11 months, do, do 10, do 11 months, mm -hmm. because in all those cases, when that time comes up, either uh, you are going to get bumped a little bit or some, or you always have the opportunity to say this to say to the shop, hey, how would you feel about delaying four weeks? 
and if they're ready for you or they can fit something in, a lot of times the shops are thrilled to do that, but you've kind of gotten ahead of the curve and protected mm -hmm. yourself a little bit because the the what's happening more often, as you mentioned, is you're not going to get your aircraft flying again within those 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, so at least that's, you know, that's one thing. You had an, you had an idea, and when we were chatting, yeah, that I, I was just about I was just about to bring that up because this is, I, this is something that I, uh, that I I've seen done, but it's but but I I think it could be done a lot more than it, than it is, and, and that is for a group of aircraft owners um, at, at a particular airport. And it doesn't have to be a very big group, could be like half a dozen aircraft owners, would get together and say, the six of us are going to hire an A&P to work for us on a dedicated basis. And um, we're, we're gonna split his cost six ways and he's gonna be available to work on our six airplanes and do nothing else. Yeah. Um, and, and then we don't have to deal with the, you know, the vagary. Now that, that, that means we're, okay, we're going to have to buy some tools and we're going to have to buy a set of jacks and stuff. We're going to have to be equipped to do the, the, so he can do this work in our hangars. But, um, the, the idea of, of having maintenance clubs or what, I don't know what you, what you'd call it. I like um, that. Yeah. Well, the, the bespoke mechanic is what we were talking about. That, that, I mean, I, I would think, I mean, say 10, right? Like, uh, uh, say you got 10 people together. There's a fair number of mechanics that have most of the tools that do all that. If you walked up to them and said, yeah. hey, $60,000 a year guaranteed, no hourly rate, nothing. This is how much you're going to make. We're all just going to pay you. Mm -hmm. And then whenever we need your work, and whatever the bylaws are for who gets who gets to work, get, gets priority. But the bottom line is, you work for us and that's it. Yeah. No, I, I think that that that's a concept that that could be employed a lot more than i have seen it in the past um, and and uh, it's something i think that you know aircraft owners are are going to find themselves desperate with with regard to, to getting maintenance and i think this is this is definitely one solution that owners should consider uh, the possibility of doing um you know that 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 brings up a, another thing you you're talking about. Well, um, it, it, we form a club. We pay this mechanic X dollars a year to 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 work for us. So we get rid of this whole time and materials concept where we're paying by the hour. That that's another huge problem I think in aviation maintenance is. Automotive maintenance has gone almost completely flat rate, um, but aviation maintenance is 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 almost exclusively time and materials. There are a few exceptions. Most annual inspections, the inspection part of the inspection, are typically a flat rate, but the remediation is not. It's it's on an hourly basis, and you, where you're paying for labor hours and you're paying for parts you're not paying for 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 you know a specific price for a specific outcome and and that's kind of um that, that's at the heart of when when maintenance sp spirals out of control um, mm -hmm. um I, you know and, and and most engine overhauls are done on a flat rate basis they you know you, you negotiate a, a price for the overhaul and that's what you pay unless Unless they find that you know that the case or crank are unserviceable, but other than that, you, you are paying a fixed amount for 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 a particular outcome. But most aviation maintenance is not done like that. It's done it's done on time materials, mm -hmm. and I really think that it would help both owners and shops if that changed. Right. Um, I I. Right. I have this vision, which I don't expect to ever happen in my lifetime, uh, of, of shops that, you know, that'd be a large shop to do this, w would basically offer you a fixed price contract per year to maintain your airplane, whatever it takes. 
Um, and, you know, the shop's going to lose a lot of money on a few of those airplanes. They're probably going to make a lot of money on some of the other airplanes. It doesn't matter. What matters is how, how they come out in the aggregate. I mean, that's how the savvy has always run its business. It does, it, it, it offers fixed price services for highly variable amounts of work. Mm -hmm. And we always, you know, we, we, we always have certain clients that, you know, we're rescuing from some disaster where we're, we're, we're losing a ton of money on that particular customer, but that doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, how, how we, how, how the company is doing overall in the aggregate. Right. And, you know, it's, it's a fix, it's fixed price. So we, we have, um, it, it's, it's very predictable. Um, our, you know, from the company standpoint, we have a very predictable revenue stream. Um, and from the customer standpoint, there's no surprises. So do you think, do you think there's anything different about, um, how owners, what decisions do they make on like how they approach components or how they approach overhaul repair, things like that to try to protect protect themselves about when it's going to have to come in again next or like do you d does anything change about your philosophy of, of of maintenance and how you approach a problem based on this scarcity of getting labor i'm not sure i i i, I was following like, you yeah like, do you make, are you recommending anything different for people in terms of how they approach maintenance on an engine, maintenance on parts? Oh God, yes. Like based on the fact that you just don't know if you're going to get shop hours again anytime soon? Well, and, and, or, or, or parts or anything. I mean, you know, the, 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 this has been a case where um, owner as an engine that's 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 coming up to tbo and and we say don't even think about overhauling that engine i mean this is the worst time you could ever pick to overhaul an engine you're going to be you know on the ground for eight months if you do that and and the engine's running okay why would you do that so hold off until things you know get get more normalized used, used to be that you know, if you wanted to overhaul an engine, you were going to be down for for 60 days. Mm -hmm. It would take 30 days to turn the engine through the shop, and and when you added the removal and reinstallation and shipping, that you'd be you'd be on the ground for for 60 days. Now it's 300 days. You know, it's it's it, it, you don't you don't want to be be doing that. So so the the shortage stuff, like I said, is kind of enforcing. The, the minimalist, on condition philosophy of maintenance. Um, because, the, because we just, we, we can't, we can't continue to over maintain the airplanes. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, no, nobody drives a car and says, oh, oh it's 100,000 miles, I guess I'm going to put a new engine in it. it, it we, we don't do that. Well, right. I I never understood why we did that in, in aviation. It never made any sense whatsoever. But but now, you know, the realities are 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 forcing that on on aircraft owners. They have to adopt a philosophy like that. Yeah. Or the, or they have to stop flying. I think one of the other challenges happening also has to do with with quality because anytime you stress a, a system like the aviation maintenance system for general aviation, you inevitably wind up with suffering in terms of quality. And uh, I know I've had some folks that I've been advising that that have, uh, you know, situations where sh because shops can't get trained mechanics, they're supervising, uh, uh, you know, people who are not trained or not licensed and doing a lot more of that. And we had one that had a cylinder put on with a whole bunch of RTV underneath the base. Mm -hmm. And luckily we caught it because otherwise that would have, could have been catastrophic. And at, at the heart of it, the, why it the, happened it, was it was it's just the one, someone if it's there. the one I'm thinking of, the owner caught it, right? Yes. The owner caught it with, uh, uh, yep, 
yep, which is yep. which is one of the things I've always said is the 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 maintenance involved aircraft owner is the last line of defense against maintenance induced failures, and that's a perfect example. That that could have been a fatal mistake. Yeah, that that cylinder would have departed the engine and at it, some point. And, and it's 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 so hard to believe that mechanics are still doing that after all of the lawsuits and all of the crashes and all of this the warnings in in you know continentals maintenance manuals in all caps saying under no circumstances should anything other than 50 weight oil be on those surfaces when you put a cylinder on and that and and it's just unbelievable that that, that right. it's it's still happening well, I think the reality, like again, in that particular case is how stressed does a shop have to be for labor when they have an untrained person that they give the job of mounting a cylinder? Yeah. Well, and look, I'm, I'm licensed. you know, well, part of this is the, 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 the FAA requires that somebody have 30 months of wrench swinging on airplane experience before they can qualify for an A&P. So how do you do that? Well, you either, you either graduate from Part 147 school or you spend 30 months working in a shop under supervision when, you don't, when you're not licensed. And, and that's, that's been you know, true forever. There, there's always, there have always been apprentice mechanics working in shops. They, they are supposed to be they're supposed supervised. to be supervised. <laughs> yeah, they're, I mean they're required by regulation to be supervised, but but the regulations don't say how much supervision they get. It, it just says sufficient to ensure that the work is being done properly, or words to that effect. You know, the other thing is, it, um, it, it, in this imaginary thought experiment of mine, where where a shop would contract with an aircraft owner to maintain your airplane for the next five years for a fixed dollar amount per year, let's say. Think of what the economic incentives would be for the shop now. They, they, are, they now ha, are, have strong economic incentive not to over maintain the airplane because they're being paid a fixed amount regardless of how much work they do. So they're incentivized to only do the work that's really necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not 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 to do all of this garbage because it's quote due unquote. That's like one of the most expensive words in aviation maintenance is the word D U E. <laughs> uh, that's always a huge red flag for me. It doesn't matter whether it's due. Well, it 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 does if it's an error within its limitation. There's an exception, but for, you know, most of the time, it doesn't matter whether it's due. Um, you know, I, I, I was just had a correspondence with a with a shop uh, director of maintenance of a of a shop in Germany. They they operate under EASA rules, which used to be a whole lot tougher than FAA rules, but but they they've recently changed so that for small airplanes that in, in non-commercial operation they they can start doing things on condition and he had a bonanza and the the, the gear motor had 2000 hours and the book says that 2000 hours is supposed to overhaul the gear motor he said he said the owner doesn't want to overhaul a gear motor you know what what, what should i do and i said you shouldn't overhaul the gear motor i said if 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 you rig the gear at the annual and 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 when you do the retraction check, it meets the timing in the manual. It says how long it should take for the gear to retract. Leave it alone. You know it's working. <laughs> um, all all of this stuff about that we're supposed to do, you know, all of this stuff, hundreds and hundreds of things at specific fixed time intervals. That's got to stop. Right. I mean, that's that's really the source of most. most but you know, if 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 the shops were were working on a on on a flat rate basis, in, instead of time materials, they would have a strong incentive not to over maintain the airplanes, which would be great for everybody. 
Yeah. yeah. And I think it would also naturally happen or probably a nice middle ground would happen even with uh, that idea of, of clubs, that idea of maintenance clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, I mean, that's, that's, there, that's, there that's one way you, you, you can create this fixed price environment that we we're talking about that, that the aircraft mm -hmm. owners can do that is to create their own maintenance association, and, yeah. you know, and, instead of, instead of relying on, on, on the, sh on the shops that are, you know, that, 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 that are overburdened and can't get them in and all of that stuff. Yeah. So, so we've got, we've got the maintenance association idea. I, I love that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We've got people doing more preventive maintenance in the field so that we're, we're not, you know, filling shops up with oil changes and tires and brakes, things like that. Um, uh, scheduling as we talked about so, to get ahead you know, of the curve. Yeah, certainly scheduling your annuals a year in advance now. Yep. Uh, and, yep. and, and hoping then, and hoping that you don't get triaged out of the system when your when your date arrives. Exactly. Exactly. But any, in, you know, other... in, in encouraging shops to raise their rates rather than complaining about it. That yes. it, it, it's a travesty that that shop rates are lower than they are in, in automotive facilities. You know, we don't really, we, we don't see the shop rate in, in automotive facilities very much because everything is, is done on a flat rate basis. So we, we, we don't usually get billed by the hour when we take our right. car in. We get billed X dollars for an oil change and Y dollars to rotate the tires. And it's, yep. it's all you know, on a fixed price schedule. So the, lay, the, the rate is hidden. But if you saw what the rate was, it would be much higher than what we what we what we pay in in, in GA maintenance shops. And I, and I think people and I, don't realize how little mechanics are actually paid in general aviation. I mean, what's the, 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 the I, I saw a figure recently that said that the average pay for for an A and P is thirty dollars an hour. So and, thirty dollars an and, hour, and, and and starting is is lower than that. So think about that. So 30, people don't realize if they're paying 100, if they're paying even $130 an hour, that the mechanic's only getting 30. Yeah. Um, and because so the shop has so much overhead. Yeah. But but I'm surprised, as we said in the beginning, I'm, I'm a little surprised that there aren't, I haven't heard of any, but if there aren't more shops that are testing the waters, even though neither one of us w really want to see expensive rates, at the end of the day, I'm surprised that you don't have that shop that wants $200 an hour, but you can get in anytime you want. Um, well, I mean, I have I have seen rates going up, but not to the extent that they need to. Mm -hmm. uh, shop, yeah. The shops have been raising their rates, but 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 only in very small increments because they're 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 afraid of alienating their customers. Yeah, but you know, to the 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 few shops I've talked about who talk talked to that have had the courage to raise their rates significantly and, and get them up to you know the two hundred dollar an hour ish area. What they reported is that very few of their customers complained, and the ones that did were the ones that they were happy to see go. <laughs> If you if you know what I mean. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Do you think that there's any chance that there would ever be regulatory change to uh, ease to help the industry if it gets really bad to 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 increase the regulatory you know, change is very very difficult. Uh, the, the the process of changing regulations for the FAA typically costs millions and millions of dollars and takes many, many years to accomplish and has to go through all of this right. Administrative Procedures Act stuff with, with, with notice and comment and lawyers involved and stuff. So it, it's very hard to get it, to get the FAA to, to change the regulations. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see that coming necessarily either. Um, but you know, one of the things that 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 I, if we were going to have a, a regulatory change, one of the changes that 
that I have felt for a long time needed to happen. And, and, it, and it's happened to some extent in Canada, but, but there, there's been no uh, indication that the FAA has any interest. And that is, would be to create something like a limited repairman certificate for an aircraft owner who basically wants A and P privileges for his own aircraft. Right. Um, to to get an A and P is is ridiculously burdensome. It you know the the experience requirement before you're allowed to even take the test is forty eight hundred hours. It only takes twelve hundred hours of experience to get an ATP. But it takes 4,800 hours to get an A and P. Now that, you know, and 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 the the A and P training is ridiculous because in the U.S. we don't have meaningful ratings on on the mechanic certificate like a piston rating or a turbine rating or a helicopter rating. We don't have that. We only have these crazy these two ratings A and P. And, and basically everybody has to have both of them, otherwise you can't do anything. So to, to, to earn an A&P, we have to essentially be qualified to work on anything from a J3 Cub to a 747 to a Black Hawk helicopter. Now that doesn't make sense. There, there ought to be a limited mechanic rating where you're trained only on the thing you're actually going to work on, particularly if it's an owner who's interested in working on his own airplane or some members of a flying club who want to work only on the flying club airplanes and don't want to hang up a shingle and don't want to make a living doing it, you know, but, yeah. but they, 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 they want to be, be able to be self-sufficient. Um, and there, there really ought to be some path to doing that that doesn't involve 4,800 hours of experience and learning about, you know, how the air conditioning systems on a on a 737 work. I mean, <laughs> we don't need to know that. Fire bottles and all the other stuff you get tested on when you get um, your AMP. <laughs> but there, there there hasn't been any interest in in the FA. Like I said, in in Canada, I think there's there's a program where 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 there's something that's similar to a limited repairman certificate for an experimental, but for a small um, certificated airplane. Yeah. And, well, and I, he, I'd love to see something like that, but, but I, I don't really expect the FAA to do anything about it. I, I agree. Well, as we approach the top of the hour, then uh, the last thing I just want to do, of course, is, is make a, a plug for your services over at Savvy Aviation, because with, without a doubt, the advocacy, with your savvy maintenance service, the one where people get a manager, is something that helps people find, you know, a, a facility that'll take their aircraft and helps support them if they get canceled by someone and figure out who can do the annual in their aircraft and helps make sure that shops don't do too much maintenance. So please put a, put your own plug in for, for savvy because <laughs> I think it's a fantastic service and really can can help during this uh, this this real challenge right now. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I think you you chose exactly the right word to the the very essence of of what we do is advocacy for aircraft owners. That we 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 try to level the playing field so that aircraft owners don't feel helpless when it comes to maintenance, and that they 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 get to make their own maintenance decisions, which is what the FAA and God intended, rather than allowing their mechanics to make their maintenance decisions for them, because mechanics have a whole different set of decision criteria. Right. But mechanics are largely driven by fear of liability. That's just the way, way it is. And um, it, in, in the same way that, that, that we see you know, defensive medicine where doctors over prescribe things because they want to make sure that they they don't get sued that because they 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 didn't do some test or something. 
Um, but, you know, we, we see defensive maintenance all the time. Um, and it's, it's, it's bad for everybody. And given the current mechanic shortage, there simply isn't the resource to do that. We have to, we have to stop it. Yeah. And the, the, you know, we, we, we try to advocate for our aircraft owners uh, by keeping the shops on a short leash is what I call it. Uh, um, and not giving them carte blanche. Um, yeah. And, and making sure that the, the work that they do really needs to be done and, and that it's, that it's, that it's, the, 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 the invoices are fair. Um, and that there's some discipline in the process so that owners actually get a chance to make decisions rather than just finding out at the end what was done and what it's going to cost. Right. Absolutely. So it is, it is advocacy. I, I kind of think, think of savvy less as a business and more as it like a church. <laughs> <laughs> That makes we, a lot of we, 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 sense. we preach the gospel and <laughs> um, but yeah this is the, I mean we're, what we're talking about is a huge problem that's going to be with us certainly for years and and we all have to pull together to to try to turn it around well this won't be the last you know, one, that we one, hear one, of one thing I, I I don't think we we've mentioned but I'll make a pitch for it this this is something i really think that organizations like aopa are going to have to get involved in um, it, uh, historically aopa has has really not done much when it comes to maintenance that's not that not its forte but um you know if aopa wants to wants to see its members continue to be able to fly they're going to have to help address this maintenance problem so I agree. mark or if you're if you're listening <laughs> let's talk let's make more mechanics i love it well mike thank you so much for taking time this evening to join us here on social flight live and and share some tips that can help owners uh, during this time i i I love the ideas. I love the maintenance club. Uh, I love the idea of getting on your, so get on it, get on the schedule, get on your mechanic, get, get everything that you can possibly do and somehow and get yourself more trained by, and preventive maintenance by, yourself. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. All right. You have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Mike. Okay. A pleasure, Jeff. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. everybody. And to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be away next week. Uh, we've got a, a vacation week of flying and back on Tuesday, June 6th at 8 p.m. with Dan Greider. going to talk about AQP and lessons for safety, new techniques that you can use in how you do your training that will dramatically increase your safety. That's Dan Greider on Tuesday, June 6th. And then on Tuesday, June 13th at 8 p.m., author Meredith Bagby. She's the author of the book, The New Guys, which were the NASA astronauts that changed space travel. Uh, it is really a fantastic story, a great read. And uh, it's being, as my understanding, it will be made a movie soon. And uh, Meredith will be here joining us on the show on Social Flight Live. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight. Blue skies. <laughs>